Welcome back to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Mr. Whelan, it's a pleasure to have you back on the show. I brought you back on here for the third time because there's always just so much more to cover about the Lenin assassination. And I respect your work a lot and expect I respect the time that you have given me to be able to talk on my show about some of this and educate me more about the case and your work uh, over the past couple of years uh, looking into this. Um, but I wanted to start off with, please, for everyone that's out there listening who might be stumbling across you for the very first time, could you introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Robbie. They're very kind words. My name's David Whelan. I'm a UK-based TV producer and writer now. Uh, my first book, amazingly, is Mind Games, The Assassination of John Lennon. Uh, sometimes I pick it up and go, how did, how did that happen? How the hell did I do that? Um, so I've been on a crazy four-year uh, investigation, uh, some would say obsession, into John Lennon's murder. Um, if you ask me why, Robbie, I couldn't tell you, to be honest. It just it, it took my interest in 2020 in lockdown and I started to get into it. I started to talk to people and I realized that it's one of the most misunderstood, famous murders in history. And I just thought I have to change that. Now, your perspective on Mark Chapman, has it changed drastically probably from what you might have understood in the beginning about it? I mean, it seems like it's a Lee Harvey Oswald incident if you've looked at the JFK stuff. But if you're coming at it from the first time and trying to really bring down the notions that it isn't just some guy who went crazy or a crazed fan and you really start peeling back the layers, you start learning more about Mark Chapman and actually start caring about the person who might be 100 percent innocent or might have been influenced in some manner. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, like everybody for 40 years, Robbie, I thought he was just a, a horrible fame seeking loser who was obsessed with John Lennon, was obsessed with the book and uh, and shot John to become famous. Case closed. Um, so as as I've kind of got into this, obviously, I've had to study Mark carefully, study his very strange life. And he did have a very strange life. So that's the first thing that I think people need to get their head around. This is not some guy. Uh, living in his bedroom, listening to Judas Priest, uh, no friends, you know, daddy, mummy issues, and just decides to snap one day and go off and, you know, kill someone famous because he hates the world. It, 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 this is not Mark Chapman. He's not like that at all. He's a very complicated, complex guy. On the face of it, he's a bit of a loser. Uh, he's one of these guys, clearly at school and in his teenage years, he couldn't get into the in crowd and Mark's curse was he wanted to get into the in crowd. It's all very well if you don't, you don't have that need for validation, but Mark Chapman really did need validation. And I think people use that against him. Um, so yeah, he's a fascinating guy. I do feel sorry for him, but I, I, even though I'm almost certain he was a Manchurian patsy and his bullets didn't kill John Lennon, I'm pretty convinced about that. I think the forensics and all the evidence on the ground and all the testimony leads towards that conclusion that, that incredible conclusion, but that's the only conclusion I can come to. I still, I can't completely give him a free pass because he, he I still think the guy's nefarious on some level. I think he was coerced. I think he was brainwashed for sure. He was certainly influenced. It's all about how much he was um, aware, Robbie, of what was going on in the programming that he had throughout his life. And the programming with Mark Chapman started when he was 15 and it went right up until 25 until John Lennon was assassinated in 1980. And he was completely, uh, all the time, surrounded by nefarious characters who were, uh, you know, psychiatrists, hypnotists, military uh, intelligence link people who just shouldn't be hanging around with Mark Chapman, shouldn't know Mark Chapman, shouldn't be, shouldn't have any interest in being near Mark Chapman and shaping his life. But there they are. And when they start to emerge, Robbie, you start to think, well, this guy clearly isn't just a lone nut who was living in his bedroom and snapped one day. There's, there's something more going on here. And um, I think on balance, I think Mark is almost certainly innocent of killing John Lennon. That's for sure. But I think on, I think there's other stuff that Mark potentially was was kind of um, was involved with. I think it's it's kind of a little bit like the Lee Harvey Oswald thing, actually, Robbie. I think that, you know, I think Mark might have saw himself as maybe an agent helping out the state. I think he might have been a useful idiot. I think he did see himself as kind of maybe helping powerful people behind the scenes. But then you've got to ask yourself the question, if that's all true, and he was aware that he was part of an oper operation that night when John was killed, how can he have kept quiet for 43 years? Why did he take the can for 43 years? You know, what did they have on Mark to make him do that? Who knows? They might have had stuff on him. They might have threatened his family. It's hard to know. But I don't think Mark was very close to his family. So that's that's one issue. His mum and dad never visited Mark in prison. His sister never visited Mark in prison. Um, they kind of all just completely ignored him once he was put away. 
uh, and they weren't particularly close to him when he was growing up. You know, they divorced. His mum and dad divorced, I think, when he was a teenager. Uh, his mum followed him to Hawaii. She was a bit embarrassing. She used to um, hang out with surf bums and things like that. So I think he wasn't particularly close to his mum. Uh, and his sister, there was no communication there at all. Sally, all these people are now dead. So there's no one who can actually vouch for Mark and uh, vouch for his kind of... Um, you know, his background when it comes to family and, and things that, you know, uh, family that he wanted to keep protected potentially. Uh, you know, he's an enigma, Mark, I think. Um, and I've studied him for four years now. And I've, sadly, I've never managed to talk to him. And I, I want to. I really badly want to talk to Mark Chapman. But Mark Chapman is guarded by two people and he's guarded very carefully. And anything that goes into Mark Chapman with regards to letters and emails and phone calls, I'm fairly certain gets has to go through these two people first, one being his wife and the other being a pastor. So um, I, I think getting to Mark is going to be very difficult. I would love to, I think if I could sit in a room, Robbie, with Mark for half an hour, I think I could convince him that he's pretty much innocent of all the things he's been uh, locked up for for the last 43 years. And I think that would be probably overwhelming for Mark to actually comprehend um, so whether that's a good thing for Mark or a bad thing, I don't know. I think if he ever was released, I think he, I think someone would probably take him out. Um, I think there's been too much uh, misinformation about Mark, and I think everyone's convinced. Most people are convinced that Mark did it, and he's, you know, this evil man who did it for fame. And you know, I'm pretty sure he would have a hard time if he ever did get released in that regard. I would, of course, from a evidence point of view, love him to be released, so we could actually get into his mind Robbie because I you know from the stuff I study with regards to hypnosis and mind control you can actually reverse a lot of the programming with the right people you know I'm, I'm pretty certain that can be done so I'd love someone to delve into Mark's mind and find out what was going on in his mind leading up to Lennon's assassination and, and what kind of programming might have been put in there because I think Mark's mind has got a lot of secrets that still have to be um have to be given up but whether we get the chance to do that outside prison or whether mark just I, I, i'm pretty certain robbie i should say i think he'll die in prison i think i don't think mark chap will ever be released i think it's far too difficult for the people who i think set him up uh, to ever allow that to happen but if it if ever did i would i would love to have a chance to talk to him and i'd love to if i'd love him to read my book i think if you read my book it would be the most disturbing uh book he's ever read uh and i think it would it would really upset him and i think he might probably realize he's been played if he's not nefariously involved and as i said earlier you know that's that's not uh, a slam dunk that's not the case well your first episode we kind of explained the mechanics of the shootings and things that don't make up and make sense in the case and we are going to go over over some of those later in this episode the second time we did talk a lot more about mark chapman i really appreciate it because you talked about the mk ultra stuff but for someone who's never looked into anything that could be opposite of the official narrative what are things to you that raised red flags when it came to mark chapman i mean some things you have told me about being surprised that the gun actually fired real bullets or just bullets at all and then sitting and reading uh this catcher in the rye book and it, there's just a little bit of confusion where you start going, wait, we have a large focus now in society about mental illness. This person has changed their statements from being possessed to the catcher in the ride to all these on multiple different parole hearings. And we're not talking about the fact that he just had one happen recently and not mainstream media didn't cover it nobody really bothered to look into it or publicize that there was this person that was still dealing with this and might be locked up for things that were out of his control i would say um but how, how would you give a breakdown to people who might not have ever really looked deeper than the official narrative on these types of things some things that really shook you well i think if you have a very sort of brief understanding and, and sort of sparse understanding of, of the murder and, and what it was all about. I think you'd probably imagine that Mark has admitted to it and can tell you in great detail what he did. Uh, the first disturbing point I think everybody needs to get their head around is Mark can't do that because Mark hasn't really got a clue what happened that night. Um, when the most important Mark Chapman interview was the one he gave at the 20th precinct, probably about two hours after the murder, possibly about an hour and a half actually after the murder. He gave a full statement that was written down by an NYPD cop, NYPD detective, but Mark was there and Mark signed it. And in this statement, I, I think this is the most pure Mark Chapman understanding of what happened that night, uh, you know, just a few hours, a couple of hours earlier when he allegedly killed John Lennon. And what you get, Robert, you don't get a guy who said, yeah, I killed John Lennon for fame. I shot him and he deserved it. And now I'm famous. And yeah, I can't wait to be famous. And 
you know, aren't I, I'm the next Charles Manson, isn't this great? It wasn't like that at all. It was a guy who was basically saying, uh, I don't remember anything. Uh, I don't remember firing. I don't remember pulling the bead. Uh, I do remember feeling it was a bit odd that the bullets were working. Uh, I don't really know why I'm here. I have nothing against John Lennon. I have nothing against the Beatles. Uh, it's all a bit of a mystery. I just felt compelled uh, to be here. I felt compelled to come and try and shoot John Lennon. It was like a, is an interesting phrase, a runaway train. It was a compulsion. Uh, but he couldn't actually remember the deed, Robbie. He couldn't remember in detail the deed. Now, interestingly, um, in the 90s, um, a pastor, another one of these nefarious pastors that surround Mark Chapman, managed to get into his cell and managed to film Mark talking about the murder. You can find this on my YouTube channel, Assassination of Lennon, this clip. And they actually, this pastor actually asked Mark Chapman a very important question. Uh, he says to him, what, what did John do after you shot him, Mark? You know, what, what, what happened? And this is this is the crucial, believe it or not, uh, crux of the whole case. Where John was shot and what John did after he was shot kind of reveals the whole thing once you understand what was possible and what was not possible. And Mark, basically, when he's asked this question, you can see his brain trying to figure out um, what did he do? Uh, uh, oh, I think he ran in and went into an office and and that's what I was told afterwards he actually says that and then he says I, I don't really remember because I turned around now if you turned around Mark as you were shooting John Lennon you're not going to be shooting John Lennon okay so you can't shoot someone and then turn around and not see what's happening when you're shooting them so did he look away while he was shooting I, I, I don't know what was going on here so there's no logical explanation for this now you would think in the Larry King interview that he did in 92 or the Barbara Waters interview that he did in 92 Mark Chapman would be able to say or be asked this is what John did as I was shooting him. He fell down in the driveway. He went up to the vestibule door and pulled it open and staggered in. Or he turned around and looked at me and gave me this evil stare. Or he turned to the left, turned to the right. Mark doesn't know any of this. He's never said it because he can't, because I don't think he was actually shooting John Lennon. I don't think his bullets, his blank bullets were doing the damage to John that he's been told later that they were doing. So my whole theory is, um, Robbie, as I, and I'm sure you know by now, is that Mark was firing blanks and there was a second shooter in place. So let, let's let's get back to Mark. So after that that kind of confused, very uh, uh, undetailed, uh, lacking in detail description of the murder, uh, you know, just literally an hour or so after. So you think he'd remember what he just done. From that point onwards, Robbie, forget it. What Mark Chapman says, you can just write it off because on day four, incredibly, uh, Chapman's second lawyer a guy called Jonathan Marks, a private lawyer who should never have got the gig and was way underqualified for getting it, placed into Mark Chapman's cell a CIA Manchurian candidate consultant called Milton Klein, who was a psychiatrist and he was a hypnotist. Jonathan Marks tried to hide this, the fact that he was a hypnotist, but thankfully, you can see this on, on, on a video on my YouTube channel, thankfully, just recently I posted it, a journalist did his job properly back in 1980 and said to Jonathan Marks when he was talking about this psychiatrist, Milton Klein, going in to see Mark and assess him, they said, isn't he a hypnotist? And Jonathan Marks had to admit, yes, he's a hypnotist, and that's part of his skill set. What the hell is a hypnotist going in into a cell to, uh, you know, talk to a killer who has, you know, it's a slam dunk? He said he did it. He was caught at the scene. He's going to be charged for murder. The DA's office were convinced we've only got this guy. There's no one else to get. Why do you need a hypnotist? Why do you need a CIA Manchurian candidate hypnotist? So once that, once Milton Klein got into his cell, you are now dealing with a guy who is dealing with hypnotists who are working for the CIA. So everything Mark Chapman has said since, I would say, the 12th of December 1980, as far as I'm concerned, has to be taken with a very large pinch of salt because, or, or a large dose of scepticism because, obviously, he's been got her. And, you know, you, there was a recent Apple documentary where you could actually hear Milton Klein hypnotising Mark in a cell, you know, because what's happened is some, some of the tapes of Milton Klein and other psychiatrists and hypnotists that were doing treating treating mark um after DIY the war. exorcisms in a cell from prison guards and things yeah like we'll that, get so. to that that's a whole different ballpark but getting onto this psychiatrist hypnotist thing the tapes were some of the tapes were conveniently given to a journalist called jim gaines now jim gaines is the guy who sort of planted the seed about mark chapman being this mark chapman being that jim gaines is a is a legit journalist he worked for people magazine he's been an editor of some big big publications Jim Gaines should know better, but right from day one, Jim Gaines started to demonise Mark, and he got into Mark Chapman's cell in the early 80s, and he did these three hit pieces on Mark in 1987, where he really went to town, 
and made out that Mark Chapman did this and Mark Chapman did that. And he he just kind of, he laid down the Mark Chapman legend, Jim Gaines. And Jim Gaines got these tapes, you see. And Jim Gaines has given out these tapes to various TV production companies over the years to kind of prove, because what Mark is saying on these tapes, the bits that we can hear, remember these are not the full tapes, and I'm sure they weren't pressing play and record every minute they were in the cell with Mark Chapman. But the bits that we do get are all, uh, uh, you know, official narrative. It's great. Mark's there going, yeah, he kind of walked past and I shot him. But again, no detail, Robbie. So even on these tapes, he's not saying I shot him and I shot him at the top of his back, I shot him in the bottom of his back. John turned around, then he staggered it. He can't do that. Mark can't do that. The only thing Mark Chapman can ever remember or recall happening at that night is John walked past him, he got a gun out and he shot him four times in the back and one bullet missed with five bullets, okay? He's always been consistent, Mark, 43 years. He can't tell you what happened after that. He's been told that John staggered in. Now, you would think if he did that, and John has to be in the driveway for this to happen because Mark is out on the sidewalk. Once John is in the vestibule inside the building, Mark can't get him. He can't shoot him. He can't reach him. So it has to happen outside. So John has to be in a place where Mark can see him as he's shooting him. How can Mark not know what's happening to John? How can he not know? Now, there's been a myth also. We should get to this on this where on where, you know, where exactly on John's body he was shot. There was a myth that was laid down by the DA's office. Uh, no, what by actually James Sullivan first, the chief of detectives, on a press conference on the night of the murder, 3 a.m., just about five hours after John was assassinated, four hours after John was assassinated. And James Sullivan says, Mr. Chapman called out Mr. Lennon. Now, this is really important. Why did he say that? Because there's no proof for it. Because Mark Chapman has never said, and he didn't say it in the statement to the NYPD that I was talking to you about earlier, he's never said that he called out to John Lennon and John turned, okay? Never said that. Yoko Ono, in one of her statements, said, we did not turn around. So where has this come from? Where has this Chapman called out and John turned? Now, I think somewhere along the line, I think James Sullivan got to know that night at 3 a.m. when he's got the whole world, you know, the whole NYPD's, uh, sorry, New York media in front of him, firing questions at him. You can actually hear this press conference on my YouTube channel. It's really, again, it's, it's a small indication at the time of the press doing their job. And they're giving James a hard time. They're asking him for specifics, but he doesn't give many specifics. But one of the things that James Sullivan does say, he says, we think Mark Shapton called out to John. Uh, he shouted out Mr. Lennon, and Mr. Lennon was going and got shot. He doesn't say James that John turned because that's just too much of a lie. But he throws in that seed that Mark called out to John. And I think the reason James Sullivan sowed that seed in is because a Chief medical officer called Elliot Gross, who was going to do the autopsy the next morning. And a medical officer, it should be said, who's been accused multiple times of falsifying autopsies, Elliot Gross. He went to the hospital round about, I would say, an hour after John had been pronounced dead. So we're talking kind of midnight, half past 12, OK, at the Roosevelt Hospital. Elliot Gross went there to inspect John Lennon's wounds, which he shouldn't have done. Because the nurses and doctors were like, what the hell are you doing here? You're getting John's body in the morning for the autopsy. Why do you need to see his wounds? But he demanded Elliot Gross that John had his bandages taken off and he had he asked for John's body to be sat up so he could walk around John's body and see his wounds. Which, by the way, all the doctors and nurses say John was shot in his upper left chest four times, three going out the back. Okay, so John was shot in the front. But we've, we've, just, we've covered this before, but I think I should just put it in there for anybody who's catching this for the first time. So I think when Elliot Gross saw that there were wounds in the front, okay, I think he then got a message to James Sullivan, chief of detectives, who may have rang him, to be fair. James was doing his job. He was, you know, it was James's, it was his big case. He may have rang up Elliot Gross and said, you've gone to see John's body. He may have instructed Elliot to go there, actually, to the Roosevelt Hospital and check out John's wounds. And I think when Elliot Gross said to James Sullivan, oh, there's four, four shots in his upper left chest, and three going out the back, it's pretty open and shut case. John was shot from the front, guy probably standing one or two feet away from him in the front. I think James Sullivan thought, right, we've got a problem here. We've got a bit of a big problem here. We got a we got a, a guy who's accused of doing this who's saying he shot him in the back. But yeah, the medical evidence is saying John shot at the front. So I think that's when James Sullivan decided to hedge his bets. And I think that's where the Mark called out John turned around myth was born. And it's a myth they bring out every now and again. It's kind of thrown in this kind of John turned, he got shot in the shoulder. It used to always be John was shot in the back. I think if you go on Wikipedia now, there's a little bit about John was shot in his shoulder arm as he turns. So they kind of want to have their cake and eat it. They want to kind of say, yeah, he was shot in his back, but he also was kind of shot in his shoulder as he turns. So they kind of, they want it ambiguous. But the one thing, Robbie, they can't get away from is Mark Chapman to this very day 
thinks he's done something that we know for certain he didn't do, i.e. shoot John in his back. So if Mark did call out to John, or if for some reason John just decided to turn around and face a stranger in a darkened driveway, 20 feet away from him at that point, why didn't Mark Chapman say that? What's Mark Chapman got to lose? If he did that, and he called out and John turned, he shot him in the front, who cares? Mark thinks he shot him dead. So whether he shot him in the chest or the back or the arm, or the legs, who cares? Well, you know, after one like, shot, you'd turn around, so you would at least get hit in the side of the shoulder or something like that, because even in the RFK assassination, that's three shots from behind, and he managed to grab somebody's tie. So you have enough movement after the first shot. Well, here's here's the problem as well with these with these real shots, the shots that the two nurses and the doctor who treated John. Remember, there were false doctors who treated John for 30 years. So this is why we've not had this information for so long, because a guy called Dr. Lin, as we know, as we talked about previously, Robbie, claimed he did it. And Dr. Lin couldn't talk about the specific wounds. He was, he was standing in the background while they're trying to save John. He didn't see the wounds up close. It was David Halloran that did it. That, it David Halloran was the surgeon who actually tried to save John. And Dr. Stephen Lim was, the, was the, basically, I call him the lion doctor. And the, the, once they called it on John and they couldn't actually say him anymore, it was, it was Lynn who went out with a nurse who was there, Barbara Cameron, to go and talk to Yoko Ono. And according to the nurses and the doctors, Lynn didn't come back in the room. So he had no chance to actually really see John's wounds up close, front and back. So Lynn never discussed this. So in his 30 years of lying, saying that I tried to save John and I pumped his heart, Lynn could have, if he was the real doctor, have said, oh, by the way, really strange. It's actually shot at the front, not at the back. Isn't that odd? But Lynn can't say that because he wasn't that guy. Halloran, I said to him, I said, why did you wait so long to get your truth out? And he just said, well, I just wanted a quiet life. I, and it came to 2015, Robbie, Halloran just got so sick of Lynn being on these documentaries saying he did all this, you know, and he pumped John's heart. And he just kept embellishing Lynn. He's like, oh, I, I lived in John's neighbourhood and, I used to nod at him and he's just trying desperately to fuse himself with Lennon, you know, with all this BS. And um, in the end, Halloran just came out and said, no, he's lying. And the, the nurses came out and said he was lying. But tragically, they did a, a film, Robbie, would you believe, in 2016 called The Lennon Report to get on top of all these conflicting medical evidence people and say, right, let's try and figure out who really was there. And, and to be fair, the film, it talks about Halloran and the nurses and it put Lynn in the background where he deserves to be. But incredibly, when they got to the wounds, the producers were talking to the nurses and the nurses read the script and they, it said John was shot in the back and the nurses said, hang on a minute, this isn't right. He was shot in the front. And in, I, we talked about this, it, it still makes me laugh. The, uh, the, the writer said to the, uh, to the nurses, well, that's what it says in Wikipedia. So that's, what, that's why I'm going with it. And the nurses said, well, Wikipedia wasn't in the room that night. We were trying to save John Lennon. So, you know, this is, you know, we were there. We were professionals. we have been working there for many years at that point. We knew how to tell an entrance wound and an exit wound. And one other small detail, I remember, Robbie, Mark Chapman has always thought he was using hollow point bullets. The DA's office has always said Mark Chapman was using hollow point bullets. The NYPD have always said Mark Chapman was using hollow point bullets. There's two big problems with that. Hollow point bullets are not supposed to pass through someone. Okay, they use this, they're meant to blow up inside someone and not pass through, which is why the NYPD used to use them back in the day. So a victim wouldn't get, you know, shot with a bullet passing through a perpetrator. Also, if you look at all the evidence vouchers, which I've got from the night of the murder, strangely, spent shells are not in there, Robbie. They just, for some reason, they're not telling us how many spent shells they found on the ground and what those spent shells were. So, you know, I've, I've done articles on the fact that two different types of bullets were found in John Lennon. You can find all that in my book and, and, and various other places. So, you know, the, the bullet thing is very difficult for them. It's been covered up. They don't want to go into it. They certainly, they're certainly happy to show you his gun, his alleged gun. Here's his gun. Isn't it great? Where's the spent bullets? Where did you find them? How many did you find? What kind of bullets were there? You well, know. why does the morgue receipt have a listing of two separate types of ammunition, but then you get to the police investigation and their actual receipts only talks about the ones. It only talks about the one specific bullet. So the morgue receipt's the only one that I found that has, and you had to send it to me when I was doing a clip that shows that there was two separate types of ammunition. There was. There was a hollow and a non-hollow found in John. Now, Mark Chapman to this day has always said he used hollow point bullets. And obviously, you can get big stammer. He might have got confused. Uh, but Mark Chapman was an armed security guard for at least a year leading up to John Lennon's murder. So he wasn't completely unfamiliar with guns. I don't think he was a marksman. He certainly wasn't a trained marksman. He certainly couldn't have shot John in the tight professional grouping that we were told by the doctors and nurses were on John's body. And I remember talking to Dr. Hallen about this tight professional grouping. And he told me, in his opinion, 
not even a Navy SEAL could pull off that hit, that tight professional grouping from the distance that Mark was away from John. And you remember, we have to, we're being asked to believe here, Robbie, let's just get down to this, that let's just say John did turn. Let's go with that myth. Okay, so Mark's 20 feet away by the sidewalk. John is over to the far right going into a vestibule. Mark calls out, John turns around. Okay, so he turns around. He stares at this guy, this stranger, this no doubt silhouetted figure in the dark. Okay, Mark is in a very darkened driveway. If you look at pictures of the Dakota driveway then and now, orange glowing lighting, very dark area. Even in daylight, it's a dark area. So Mark's there. John's there. Mark starts to fire away. An untrained marksman, by the way, starts to fire. It's a chamber, so it's not automatic. So there is a slight delay between each shot. We're asked, we're being asked to believe that John Lennon stood dead still and allowed Mark to hit him four times in his upper left chest area, three just above his heart, one near his shoulder, without moving one iota, because that's what he'd had to have done. He'd had to have stayed dead still for Mark to get off that tight pattern. Are you trying to tell me he's not going to go this? He's not going to go that? He's not going to put his arm up? He's not going to fall down? And are you trying to tell me that he didn't collapse there and then, Robbie? Because I spoke to the doctors and nurses again, as I told you many times, and they said that the second John was shot, it would have been someone right in front of him, one or two feet away, and he would have dropped instantly because his left subclavian artery was completely blown away. So all his movement down his left would have been gone. Major arteries around his heart were blown away. He couldn't breathe. Okay, He, he, was, he would have dropped instantly. He's not, he's not going anywhere. But here's where it gets really sinister, Robin. This is what the official narrative wants us to believe happened. And they have to say this because John's body wasn't found in the driveway. And again, this is one of these big myths. Everybody seems to think, everybody saw it. Everyone said they saw it. John was found in the driveway. Chapman was sitting there right next to him reading the book. And it's an open and shut case. It's, it's nothing is further from the truth. Nobody saw it. They actually said they saw it. We'll get into that in a little while, the witnesses and stuff. But here's what they want us to believe. And I've said this so many times, but it really does need reiterating. After John is hit with four bullets, okay, in his body, if you want to go with the official narrative, he was shot in the back and shoulder. If you want to go with Mark Chapman's narrative, he was shot in the back. If you want to go with the doctors and nurses who actually treated him, he was shot in the front. Take your pick. Doesn't matter. But everybody agrees, four big holes in John Lennon. So his subclavian artery is now gone. Major arteries around his heart has now been blown away. He's got three bullets that not only did so much damage, they actually went through him. They didn't stay in, they actually went in and out. So he must have been bleeding profusely. He walks up. This is what they want us to believe. After this happens, he walks up to a vestibule door, he pulls it open. He's in the little sort of wooden porch area now. He walks up six steps, fairly, fairly steep steps. There are some mahogany doors at the top of those steps. They may have been open, they may have been closed. He had to get through them. He gets through those mahogany doors. He's now in a lobby area. To the left of him is a desk, is a, is a lobby front desk where, where the concierge works. Behind him is, a, is an open front plan concierge's office. And to the extreme left is a little swinging saloon door, which allows you to go from the lobby into the concierge's office. John walks through that, 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 that area, that swinging door. Why he went that way, by the way, I do not know, because actually he could have, if he was still walking and running and talking, which we're being asked to believe, he could have asked the concierge, Jay, who told me he was standing by the desk, can you buzz me into my into my studio, my apartments, which is just literally across to the right in the lobby. So that's where John would have you'd have thought he'd have tried to get to home, not into an open plan concierge's office. So remember, John's running away from a guy who's just shot him. But apparently John decides to go into the concierge's office, not, not asking the concierge, buzz me in, let me in, which is what the concierge always did. So John goes into the concierge's area through a swinging door. He's in the concierge's front office now. He runs, we've been told, past the concierge, Jay Hastings, and says to Jay, I've been shot, I've been shot. Twice, he can talk. He goes through John's, uh, through Jay's office into a back office, the superintendent's back office, which is not actually backing on to the, the, the concierge's front office, it's over to the side, but they always call it the superintendent's back office. He runs into there, John, and collapses on the floor, face down, and starts to bleed out. And that is where all the cops who found him said they found him in that back office, okay? Face down, bleeding out. So they know that the cops found him there. So they have to give you a story that he got from the driveway or the, or the vestibule stairway area into that back office. But with those wounds, Robbie, it's an impossibility. And I think when you start to figure out how John got from that driveway or, or vestibule stairway area into that back office, you're halfway to figuring out what really happened.
Well, here's what brings up to the next question I was going to ask you. Did somebody carry John Lennon into that back office and drop him off? And it goes to the person that everyone keeps saying is the same Jose Padermo. And I thought you told me it wasn't. So is it, is it not? Is, is it, <laughs> why don't we have more statements on Jose Padermo? He seems like the only uh, witness there that actually might know a lot more information than everybody else. Uh, okay. So let's talk about the dormant. So there were three people there that night. There was Yoko and John. Okay. And we'll get into Yoko maybe a bit later. And there was this famed doorman, Cuban doorman called Jose Padermo, the, the infamous Jose Padermo, who you would think would have seen everything. Okay, there's a doorman. He was there in a the little gold booth just by the driveway, just by the iron gates. He comes out, he opens the door. That was part of his job. So John and Yoko would get out of the limo on the sidewalk and walk into the driveway. Uh, you think he'd see everything. Well, here's, here's why we can't be sure what Jose saw. We can't be sure because for some reason, the DA's office and the NYPD don't want to share his, his statement. They're, they're keeping his statements under wraps. Now, he would have been, he would have given numerous statements. He'd have given, I know for a fact, because people have told me, they went to the station with him that night to give a statement, which is what you should do to give a witness statement on the night of the matter, as fresh as you can at the 20th precinct. So I know he went in the van to do that. And I know he went in the van with Nina Rose and some people say that I'm not sure Nina did go with him, but I know for sure, for a fact, he went with Joe Manny, who's a lift operator. We can talk about him in a little while. Uh, so we, I know I, people have told me that they went with Jose. Joe said he went with Jose to the station to give a statement at the 20th precinct. Interestingly, Jay Hastings, the concierge, the Hastings who saw the man who saw John run past him, he didn't go to the station to give an official statement that night and didn't want to. Now, why he wasn't forced to do that, I cannot tell you. But for some reason, Jay didn't go that night. So, you know, you need to. I've asked Jay this question. I said, why? Why didn't they ask? You know, why didn't you go down and give an official statement? And Jay just says, well, um, you know, I, I didn't feel I didn't need to. They asked me lots of questions that night in, in my office. But that's not how it works. You're supposed to go down to the station and give an official statement. So he didn't do that. So let's get back to Jose. So Jose, for some reason, for seven years, we're never told Jose's name. Okay, so the media decide never to mention the guy's name. The main witness to John Lennon's murder, for some reason, I don't know if it was a deep notice that was put out in the press, but they didn't want his name out there. I just can't figure out, Robbie, why. So he was always just referred to as the doorman. Okay. And then in 1987, Jim Gaines, that journalist I spoke to you about earlier, who you know did a real hit job on Mark Chapman, he came out in one of his Mark Chapman hit pieces in 1987 in People magazine and said the doorman was a man called Jose Padermo, and he was an ex-Cuban, anti-Castro Cuban, and he spoke to Mark Chapman about the JFK assassination and the Bay of Pigs. So people... People are kind of going, hmm, that's interesting. Hmm, okay, Cuban, Bear Pigs, Castro, ex Cuban, Jose Padermo. So this is in 87. So you can imagine they probably did this research via newspapers and old magazines in the library, because of course there was no internet in those days. But what they did find out was through the records, there was a Jose Padermo who did fight at the Bear Pigs, and he was a very serious dude who worked for an outfit called Operation 40. In fact, he ran Operation 40, which was a CIA clandestine group of assassins basically that were allegedly supposed to be going into Cuba after the bad pigs to do a cleanup. So this Jose Padermo is a very serious dude. And if he was working the door, if it's the same Jose Padermo at the bad pigs working the door when John Lennon was assassinated, you can imagine how people went, oh that's it. We've we've solved it. It was a QI, it was a CIA Cuban hitman. He did it. Mark Chapman's a patsy. Now Mark Chapman is a patsy, but that Dakota Jose Padermo is not. Dakota Bay of Pigs, Jose Padermo. And the reason I know this is I know for a fact that Dakota Jose Padermo started working at the, at the Dakota in 1969. Now, John Lennon didn't start living there for a few years later. So how could he know? How could he know to start working at a building to be in place 11 years later to take out John Lennon when John Lennon had no plans in 1969 to go and live at Dakota? Okay, so he was still in the UK at that point. So it, it, it's, it's nonsense. It, it's clearly not the same guy. We know a fair bit about Dakota Jose. He had two sons and a daughter. Two of his sons strangely went to work at the Dakota after Jose retired in the 90s, which is quite interesting. I'd like to talk to those brothers, but they won't, they won't talk to me. Uh, I'm sure they've got some stories to tell. Uh, we know that after the, the murder, um, Jose, Dakota Jose went to work in the basement. He had really poor English, so he didn't often uh, work in the back office where Jay Hastings was. So he kind of was either grunt man down in the basement or he's out on the door. But we know for a fact that after the murder, he didn't want to work the door anymore, which is kind of fine. You kind of get that. But what's a bit odd, let's let's get into Dakota Jose and what's odd about him, because he's not he's not a guy we should give a free pass here to. 
because he did some strange things. Strange things, number one, is he wasn't actually working the door at the time John Lennon was assassinated. For the weeks and months leading up to that, he was working in the back office, often. And Jay Hastings was tasked to come and work out on the front doing the door with Joe Manning, the lift operator, because, according to Jose, he had bad legs and his legs were causing him problems. And the Dakota was very benevolent. From what I've heard, they weren't a very benevolent outfit, the people who ran that building in those days. But for some reason, as far as Jose was concerned, they were all up for doing whatever Jose wanted. And even though Jose had very poor English, apparently, he was allowed to work in the back office. But the poor English thing is odd because remember Jim Gaines said that he had this conversation with Mark Chapman about the JFK assassination. So to have a conversation about the JFK assassination and tell Mark all about yourself, his English couldn't have been that poor. But anyway, we'll go with it. The night of the murder, Jose's in the back office, okay? And no, the day before, sorry. No, actually, let me get this right. The morning of the murder, okay? December the 8th, 1980, Monday morning, Jose is coming to work. He says to Jay in the afternoon, do you know what? It's quite a mild evening, which it was. Everyone said that evening for December was mild. I fancy going out and taking the air. My legs feel all right today. I'll go out and do the door. You stay in the you stay in the concierge's area. So for some reason, Jay wanted to, uh, Jose wanted to make sure that he worked the door that night, which is suspicious, you know, because he wasn't working there for quite a while. And then suddenly that night, he decides he wants to take in the air and be on the door. So he made sure he was the guy that was there when Chapman was allegedly doing what he was doing, which is, I think, very strange. The second thing that Jose did or didn't do is after gunfire was heard in the driveway um, we hear that Jose goes up to Mark Chapman and we get this testimony from the NYPD, the DA's office and Mark Chapman himself sometimes they say Mark dropped the gun that he allegedly had sometimes they say Jose shook it out of his hand, one thing we're fairly sure of, and we say fairly, I can't be that sure but I'll tell you why in a moment But the gun was apparently at Mark's feet, a gun and Jose kicks Mark's gun to the back of the driveway over to the vestibule where John Lennon allegedly went into. Now, question number one, why did you kick it, Jose? Why didn't you just pick it up? You know, what are you doing playing soccer, as you guys would say, with a gun? You know, what's that about? Why did not you just pick it up, put it in your pocket, take it indoors, make sure he couldn't pick it up again? So at this point, remember Mark's docile. He's about to start reading a book, okay? He's confused. But Jose says another thing to Mark at this point. He says, get out of here. This is what Mark Chapman told him. This is what Mark Chapman has alleged he told him. Jose says, get out of here. Get out of here. Just leave. And why does he do that? The gun's gone. Chapman's docile, looking confused. Jose would have known, because he pressed a, a panic button in his gold booth, he would have known that the cops were on their way. 72nd Street, just across the road from Central Park. Cops would have been there within a minute, 90 seconds tops. He would have known this, okay? But he wants... The perpetrator that he thinks shot John Lennon to run? What's that about? What, what is that about? That, that didn't make any sense. So anyway, let's get back to the gun story. So Jose then allegedly walks to the back of the driveway, walks around the gun. Joe Manny, our next guy in the story, down in the basement, basement crew, lift operator, sometimes doorman, he hears what he says of three shots. Strangely, he doesn't hear four. He doesn't hear five. He said he thought he heard three. He comes up in the basement with two co-workers, which is really important, those two co-workers, because they verified Joe did this, because they all gave separate statements to the NYPD, which I've got, and they all said they did the same thing in different statements. So Joe's lucky there, because some people say Joe's the shooter. Joe's not the shooter. I know that for a fact now. So Joe comes up, and he says he sees Jose Padermo in the driveway, at the, at the end of the driveway, by the vestibule, walking around a gun in an agitated state. And Jose then allegedly kicks the gun a little bit more, so he still loves kicking this gun, over to um, Joe and says, Joe, take this gun and put it in the, put it in the, um, put it, put it downstairs, put it in the basement, take it away. Amazingly, Joe picks it up and with his two co-workers, they've all said the same thing. They all go down into the basement and put the gun in a drawer. Okay, and they come back up. Uh, two co-workers go and have an argument with Chapman, which has been checked out by the NYPD. They said there was a guy arguing with Chapman in Spanish. That would have been a guy called Victor Cruz, one of the co-workers. And um, you've also got Joe Manny coming up to go and do something else, to go and look at John's body. And we'll get into what he saw later, because what Joe Manny saw is really interesting. But anyway, so Jose, here's, here's some questions. Why did you not pick that gun up? How did you know Joe Manny was going to come up and take it anyway? So, so it's, it's kind of like, how do we know that gun is Mark Chapman's gun? Because 
Mark Chapman can't really remember how it got on the ground. Mark Chapman can't remember what happened to his gun. Did Mark Chapman even have a gun? Here's another question. Was that even a gun that Mark Chapman even had in the first place? If he was imagining he was doing something we now know he wasn't doing, was he just using his fingers? Was he just, you know, was it all in his imagination? Who knows? Who knows? It's, it's, it's not definitive. We don't have a Zapruder film and we don't have an eyewitness that can say what happened. So now we, but we do have an eyewitness crucially that I found in the detective notebooks that came on the scene, Robbie, just after gunfire, a woman called Nina Rosen, who's a really important person because Nina is a witness up until now has been fairly sort of concealed. There was a, a famous writer called Albert Goldman who wrote a very um, controversial book about John Lennon back in the, uh, would have been, I suppose, late eighties and uh, maybe mid eighties and very controversial talking about how Lennon was this kind of bad person. I won't go into it. It's, it's, it's well researched, but dubious on a lot of points. He also Goldman paid a lot of people for their testimony. I think once you start paying people to say things, you can't really, you know, uh, take what they say as, as gospel. But Goldman mentioned Nina very briefly and said Nina was there and she was a dog walker and she came on the scene, but he didn't give any details about what Nina saw. But I've got a statement now. And here's what Nina said she saw. So she came back on the scene after hearing gunfire. She sees Chapman, okay, big burly man with a coat and a fur hat. She sees the doorman, who she knows because she's a dog walker. So she knows how to identify a Dakota doorman who would have had a uniform on. So she says she saw a doorman. She saw the perpetrator, Chapman. She didn't see John Lennon. OK, so he's maybe on his magical mystery tour. Maybe not. Maybe he's a dark lying dying in the vestibule. We'll get to that later. She doesn't see a gun. OK, so think about that. So if she doesn't see a gun. And I would say she got on the scene somewhere sort of 10 to 20 seconds after the fire, the gunfire. She hears gunfire. She double backs. Did she become a star witness or anything to the actual? No, no, no. Bur buried, buried, totally buried. Ne never seen her statements officially. Never released. They just completely. And she says in her statements that she wasn't asked to go to the police station again. Like Jay Hastings, a crucial witness wasn't asked to come and give her give her statement. How weird. Anyway, she doesn't see a gun. Now here's the thing: if she gets, think about it, right? Mark Chapman's just shot John Lennon allegedly, right? Okay. He's put his gun down. He has to drop it, maybe. Or Paderma has to come over and say, what have you done? What have you done? Get out of here, get out of here, shake it out of his hand. And then paderma has got to kick it. That's probably going to take more than 10 seconds, isn't it? That's probably going to take, I would say, up to 30 seconds for that to happen. But Nina doesn't see any of this. Nina just comes on the scene quite quickly. There's no gun. Where's the gun that's on the ground and, and Paderma's about to kick? There's no gun. Now, interestingly, she says someone, a man, turns to her and says, you better get out of here. Now, Goldman thought that man was Chapman, but I've got a feeling that man was the doorman. I don't think Dakota Jose wanted her to be seeing what was going on there. And he said, you better get out of here. And apparently she did. But before she got out of that scene, she saw no gun, which should have been there, or at least she should have seen Padermo kicking it. So that's that's disturbing. So did Padermo just walk to the back of the driveway when he heard Joe Manny come up? Did he just drop a gun? Could have done. No one would know otherwise. So how did that gun get there? So that's interesting. She saw no John. She saw Yoko, this is troubling, in the far courtyard, okay? She said, I saw Yoko Ono in the courtyard. Now, the courtyard is an area beyond the driveway. It's a gated area. When you get to the end of the driveway, you get the vestibule, you get the, the lift operator alcove where Joe Manny came out off left and right. And behind that, you get, there's iron bars, okay? And behind that is a courtyard with a fountain. She, so she, and Nina would have known this because she dog walked past this, this spot every day. Okay, So she knew the Dakota intimately. When she says courtyard, she knows what she's talking about. She said she saw Yoko Ono in the courtyard screaming. Now, why is that a problem? I'll tell you why that's a problem. Yoko Ono and the concierge Jay Hastings have said that she went in straight after John. She clearly didn't do that, according to Nina Rose. She's out screaming in the courtyard. Okay, So she didn't either... She's got confused about when she went in, possible PTSD, or Jay Hastings is lying about her coming in straight after John. OK, so that that didn't happen according to Nina. And then Nina says something else quite incredible. She says she heard the doorman say to Chapman, you better get out of here. The cops are going to be here in a few minutes. Now, that's a bit more than just get out of here, isn't it? That's kind of that's pleading. That's basically saying you're about to get caught. Run. And I don't think Mark Chapman 
was meant to stand there, dose up. I think Mark Chapman was meant to run. And I think there was a Tippett type character, a Jack Ruby type character, potentially watching the scene, ready to be a vigilante member of the public or a vigilante cop shooting the fleeing Mark Chapman with a gun or not with a gun, as may be. I don't think Chapman was meant to live. I think he was meant to run. and I think he was going to be taken out. And I think those Padermo pleading to a docile guy, remember, confused docile guy. And Padermo was, you know, we've got a picture now of Padermo. There's been so many BS pictures of Padermo. You know, you've got this, you got this guy who's like a kind of, it was, a, I think it was an Italian kind of hypnotist, like it's a stage kind of circus guy with a moustache. Oh, there's, but that's not Padermo. But people put him up as his picture. There's loads of false pictures of Padermo, but I've managed to get the real picture of Padermo now. So if you go on, on my uh, Instagram, you can find it. He's a big guy. He's, he's a wide guy. But according to all accounts, he was a no-nonsense, ball-like figure who could handle himself, okay? Why is he telling Chapman to run? Why didn't he just arrest him? Why didn't he shout to uh, Joe Manny or Victor Cruz or shout to Jay Hastings, come out and help me get this guy. We'll, we'll get him on the ground. No, that's not what Jose Padermo wanted to do. Dakota Jose wanted Mark to run. And I just think for that alone, I think Dakota Jose is a man of great interest. Now, you talk about my sub stack and stuff I've got on there. What's happened recently is a Lennon insider, a guy called Mike Medeiros, who I've interviewed a few times, uh, who worked with the Lennons at the time before the murder and after the murder. So he's a, he's a man of great interest historically. And he was their kind of botanist. He was their plant guy. He kind of watered the plants and watered the trees. And he became their archivist. He's an interesting man. He's come out of a story, Robbie, recently. And he told me this story. And I put it in my book. And it is a very interesting story, if it's true. But too much about the story doesn't stack up. Here's the story that Medeiros says. He says, a couple of days after the murder, uh, the Lennon's bodyguard, an ex-FBI bodyguard, a guy called Doug McDougall, came to uh, see um, Medeiros, okay, the plant guy, and said, I'm going to interview Jose Padermo, the doorman. Come and attend with me. And why do you do that? Why, why would an ex-FBI bodyguard ask a plant guy, ask a botanist to come and stand in as a witness to an interview with the doorman about the murder? And I said to him, why did he do that? Um, Mike, who said, oh, I had some stuff on him. He knew I knew stuff about him. So I think him allowing me to attend that meeting was a recognition that I knew stuff about him. And I'm thinking, well, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> if you had some dirt on him, why would he ask you to attend a meeting that you didn't need to attend? <laughs> it's like, that doesn't make sense. But anyway, let's just go with it and say this meeting happened with Doug McDougall, the ex-FBI Lennon bodyguard, and with Medeiros in attendance in the concierge's office, apparently. And apparently, Padermo told McDougall, witnessed by Medeiros, that after John was shot, he walked up to the vestibule, okay? And John was in the vestibule, shot in the front, which is interesting, which is where we know he was shot. So that, that bit's probably true. And Padermo lift up John, lifted him up and walked him up the stairs into the lobby and left him. Sometimes Madeira says in front of the desk. Sometimes Madeira says in the concierge's office, take your pick. Uh, and then he comes back out, Padermo, and does the thing with a gun. OK, now here's the problem. Those timelines don't work. OK, so if you go with what Nina Rosen said, and Medeiros couldn't have known about Nina Rosen until my book came out, so this was a bit awkward for Medeiros. Nina Rosen came on the scene. She doesn't say she sees Padermo going in to help John. She says she sees Padermo having a chat with Chapman. OK, so he's not doing what he's allegedly doing. Or if he did do it, he took his time doing it. So that's that doesn't make sense. And if he did do that, why didn't Mark Chapman say he did it? Why didn't Mark Chapman say, after I shot John, the doorman went to help him? I saw the doorman go in after him. Chapman never says that. Why doesn't Yoko Ono say that? Yoko Ono says, never mentions a doorman helping a husband. In fact, Yoko Ono has never said that she saw Mark Chapman's bullets hit her husband, which is very interesting. She's had 43 years to say it. She's never said it. Jay Hastings, I said to Jay, did Jose carry John in? No, didn't happen. He just ran past me, which I don't believe is true either. So... Either Jay Hastings, Mark Chapman and Yoko Anna are all lying and Medeiros is telling the truth or Medeiros is embellishing and he's saying something that's not um, not true. Or, to be fair to Medeiros, 
potentially Padermo was saying a lie to muddy the waters or to make himself look like a hero. That's possible as well, to be fair to Medeiros. Um, so the Padermo mystery will only be sort of cleared up, Robbie, getting back to your question quite a while ago now about Padermo. Sorry to rattle on here, but it's, there's a lot to get through. That will the, the, the questions about Padermo, who he was and what he saw, blah, 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 that night, will only be sort of um, verifiable once we get his statements. Because we know he went to the NYPD that night, 20th precinct game statement. We know the DA's officer said that they, I've, I've spoken to Kim Hogreff, well, I've texted him a few times about it back in the day. He won't talk to me now for obvious reasons. But he used to tell me, and he, he, he confirmed to me, Kim Hogreff, that Padermo was interviewed numerous times as a, as a person of great interest, of course. You know, he was, he was allegedly a great witness. But the DA's office and the NYPD have, have no problem releasing to various journalists and books the statements, the witness statements of most of the people, Joe Manny, Yoko Ono, a cab driver, various people who came on the scene later, they got, uh, people in the Dakota who saw things. Fine, Here, here's all their statements. But the one statement, the one statement they refuse to release is Padamos. And as I said in my recent Substate article, Robbie, I think that's either because he didn't see anything and the witness who should have seen everything and bolstered their official narrative can't do that, so that's awkward, or he saw something that didn't quite fit with their narrative. Because he said one last telling thing, Robbie, which I'll just the last thing I want to say on Padamo. One of the cops, Peter Cullen, who got there, one of the first cops who got there on the scene, he said that Padermo told him that the bullets pushed John through the vestibule doors. Now, those doors pull out, okay? They pull out into the driveway and you walk into them. If the bullets push John through those doors, John's being shot inside that vestibule on that stairway by someone, okay? You cannot have bullets push you through those doors from Mark Chapman's bullets outside those doors in the driveway, okay? So that, what Cullen said, Padermo said there, is very interesting. So I wonder, whether Padermo saw this, saw someone shooting John inside the vestibule on the stairway and saw John, as he said to Cullen, pushing the bullets, pushing John out into the driveway, partly through those doors that would have pushed out into the driveway. And I think if that's true, that would have crushed the official narrative and Mark Chapman would be a free man today and he never would have been, um, he never would have been charged for the murder and we'd be looking for this second, second shooter. But of course, I don't think the NYPD in the DA's office yeah. wanted that, Robbie, because when you have a guy leading up to Christmas, who thinks he did it, not quite sure how he did it, but he thinks he did it, thinks he was compelled to do it. He's reading Capture the Rye, he's a bit weird. Uh, yeah, open and shut case, let's just, uh, you can imagine up high, can't you? You know, the, 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 the rule coming down, could have been the mayor's office, could have been higher, it could have been, a, you know, a state thing. Just, guys, you got your guy, yeah? Just, let's get this guy. You've mentioned it in the last conversation we had, but if you look at the kind of historical remembrance of like he had a shrine in his room of his hotel room of Lennon, uh, Catcher in the Rye, candles, everything kind of lit um, and a lot of these weird photographs. But I, I thought Todd Rundgren was always his thing. He was not really a Beatles fan, which makes this fan obsession just even more suspicious. But one thing you mentioned, which was the unmarked pills that were in Mark Chapman's hotel room. You know, you start you sent me the documentation for that about these pills. And uh, I think a lot of people don't really know that because when you start hearing about a shrine to this person in a hotel room, then it makes the killing even more like, OK, well, yeah, he was just a crazed fan. But uh, the statements of the Todd Rungan tapes and not being a fan really of Lennon, you know, those are conflicting with the whole official obsession narrative. You're right. I mean, the, the obsession narrative fits in nicely with the killed him for fame narrative. They kind of morph. They're actually two different things. If you think about it. You know, either killed him for fame or is obsessed with Lennon. Which one is it? But they, they kind of want to have their cake and eat it with those two. Uh, and they often they interchange over the years. So they, they bring it's almost like they take a motive off the shelf, Robbie. He did it because Jesus wanted to do it. He did it because he wanted fame. He did it because he wanted to be John Lennon. He did it because he was obsessed with John Lennon. He did it because, come on, guys, why did he do it? Come on, let's let's just have it because Mark Chapman doesn't know. See, this is why they've got to come up with this crap because all the psychiatrists and hypnotists that went in there that messed with his brain, and I know they messed with his brain, and I know Milton Clone was put in there to make him plead guilty, and he did. He succeeded. We can get into how he did that later. He created he that little affair. people kingdom. That's what that's he created what got him. the little people kingdom. He sure did. So we know what Klein did, and we know how he did it, and we know why he did it. But let's get back to that. that you're right. That hotel display is quite important. So he, he the, the 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 morning of the murder. 
Chapman says, allegedly, he laid out, he could have been, of course, hypnotised to think he was doing this, but the display's there. We know the display was there because they've shown us photos of it. So there are some photos that they're very kindly released, redacted, of course. They don't show you the plane tickets. They don't show you the plane tickets, you know, when he came in and went out and return journey and all the rest of it. But some bits are there. You get the, you get the photos, you get the Bible, you get, uh, you know, the Todd Rundgren tape. He was a big Todd Rundgren fan. All his friends have told me that. And Chapman himself has admitted that. So Lennon wasn't a big thing for him. But, you know, I think the, the display was kind of the DA's office, their kind of um, their reason for constantly going on about this display on every single Lennon documentary is, oh, it proves he wants to be famous. He didn't want anybody to not know about him. So when he knew he was going to do this thing for fame, he wanted you to know about his time working with it and his children. He wanted you to know about his music taste. He wanted you to know that he was a good Christian, blah, blah, blah. All right. So that, that's what. And he also had a, had a hit list, apparently. But what's interesting is that hit list wasn't on that display. And that hit list wasn't in the evidence voucher. And that hit list <laughs> looks like it was written by an eight year old. Mark Chapman has never said he remembers writing a hit list. Okay? Never. So, but apparently this hit list proves. And they, basically the hit list had eight names on it. Six or seven names. I forget what they are now. Jackie Anassis, various other people. Five or six names. I can't remember what they are. They're famous names from the time. Okay. And they prove, apparently, that Mark Chapman, if he didn't get John Lennon, John Lennon's at the top, okay? So it says hit list underlined, like an eight-year-old would do. Then you've got John Lennon, uh, Jackie Anassis, Ronald, I can't remember now who they are, but it's five, five or six names. George C. Scott was one. And um, they they never said where this came from, this hit list. They, whether they find it down the back of the sofa? Did they find it in his back pocket? We know it wasn't on him, because we've got the we've got the $2,000 of cash he had on him that night, which they never quite sort of told us how where he got that from quite a lot of money two thousand dollars in 1980 but he had that on him he had his driving license on him with his home address on how convenient for this this killer to uh make sure that his address was all nicely neatly wrapped up for the nypd um but this hit list wasn't there so this just emerges over the years this hit list, and the legend of it emerges and it becomes so ridiculous to the point robin where at one of chapman's parole hearings one of the um parole governors actually asked Mark about the hit list when they're talking about he did it for fame and all this BS and, and they I think it's brought up that Elizabeth Taylor was on there because it, this hit list has had it's been added to over the years so in, in the media Paul McCartney's on there you know you name it Elizabeth Taylor they just they just they just throw names in you know I think Marlon Bradley was one of the names on there but they, they throw other names in you know, if you haven't been on Mark Chapman's hit list, you just you haven't made it in life, as far as I'm concerned. You need to be. John Hinckley just released a new album. I bet he probably would have been on that hit list. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's a shout out. I can imagine someone like Beyonce and Jay Z would quite like be on the hit list. You know, it sort of proves you must be a real top, you know, international famous person if you're on Mark's hit list. But what's fascinating and what's funny is they start to discuss Mark Chapman's hit list with him on one of his paroles, and he starts to talk about Elizabeth Taylor being on his hit list. Chapman mentions, oh, yeah, I think Elizabeth Taylor's on the hit list. She's not on the hit list. She's not on there. She's not on this alleged hit list. Her name's not on there. So Chapman has heard the BS over the years, and he's now regurgitating the BS to the parole board. So he's basically telling them what he wants them to hear. But anyway, Chapman's parole will just made this a conversation for later down the line. But you're right. That hotel inventory, and I've got the inventory, because they did an inventory, an official inventory, an evidence voucher, and you've got the Bible, the tape, and blah, blah, blah. And I think I even put that in my book, actually. But there's also another evidence voucher that came from this hotel room that they didn't tell the public about, that they concealed, that they covered up. There's no other word to describe it. The DA's office and the NYPD covered this up, and they only got it when I managed to get access to the lead detective's paperwork. And in the paperwork, there's another evidence voucher for the hotel room, and you've got 120 unidentified, different, three different types of red pills, 120 in volume. I think there's a 40, there's a 40, and a 20. And 20 of those pills, Robbie, that are unidentified, that were sent off to be verified in a, in a lab, so they, they clearly weren't labelled what they were. They had to be sent off to be verified. Were red. Now, if you know your MK Ultra mind control history, Thorazine. you will know that Thorazine is a very famous red pill. And Mark Chapman had 20 red pills in his hotel room on the morning he allegedly went off to kill John Lennon. So that, to me, is shocking when I found out that. I, I was literally shook to the core that they concealed that. Because if they were just vitamins... And they do say on the document, apparently vitamins, apparently vitamin C, apparently aspirin. You know, they're trying to figure out what they are before they're sent off to the lab. If they were innocent, fine. He had some vitamin C, he had some vitamin D, he had some aspirins, you know. But again, if he did, you're going off to kill John Lennon. Why are you bringing along health pills? You got what two you, grand, buy some orange juice. Ain't that expensive. Doesn't make sense, Robbie. Doesn't make sense. 
So, so much doesn't in this case. So much doesn't. How big of a problem was the Dakota first responders on the scene to the case? And when it comes to looking at either evidence or testimonies or just specific work that we have to go off of? Um, they don't say much. Um, Cullen and Spiro, officers Cullen and Spiro turned up first. Spiro grabbed Chapman, put him up against the wall. Spiro got a strange bond with Chapman over the years. He wrote him letters and stuff, and Chapman wrote him letters. Spiro is a man of great interest to me. Again, like so many people in this story, he's got a Navy background. Uh, I think he's one of these, I didn't put this in my book, but he's one of these kind of Knights of Malta, kind of, he's in these kind of secret society thing. I, I didn't put it in there. It was too salacious. Yeah, it's something like that. And I think it's some kind of Knights of the Order of something or other. But I, Knights I, Templar? I didn't, yeah, it could be. I don't know. He, he, he was, he's dead now. So sad I didn't get to him. But anyway, Spiro, Spiro had this weird connection with Chapman disturbing it and Spiro made it his job as well after the murder to go and hang out with the nurses not hang out with them but go and talk to them go and hang out with people like May Pang and Mara Castellano Peter New John take them to lunch spread misinformation about the murder to them um I remember Mara Castellano who was May Pang and John Lennon's assistant spoke to him about this and he said that Spiro told him that these alleged tapes which is another interesting thing we could get into that Jay Hastings originally said that John had on him and sprayed them across the floor in the office it wasn't tapes at all. It was uh, it was just a Carol King tapestry tape that they found in um, John's leather jacket, and there wasn't tapes at all. There actually was tapes. There was a, there was a recorder and a tape, blank tape, because I've got the evidence voucher now. So a, a embryonic Sonny Walkman and a blank Sonny tape was found on John's being. We don't know whether it was on the floor, whether it was in his jacket, but when John collapsed in that back office. He did have a tape on him or around him near near the evidence, near, near the scene, near the crime scene. Interestingly, Jay Hastings sometimes says there were lots of tapes in some of his testimony, sometimes said there were no tapes. In one interview I had with him early on, Jay said, no, I don't remember tapes. There might have been an envelope. Last interview I had with Jay, he's now saying there might have been tapes. So the tapes is a bit of a mystery. But getting back to Spiro, let's get back to Spiro. So Spiro's got Chapman. He's sort of talking to Chapman now. Officer Cullen says to Padermo what's going on. And Padermo says, as I said earlier, uh, the bullets pushed John through the door. Okay, so he gave he gave Cullen that statement. Cullen runs in and up into the back office, sees John face down, comes back out into the driveway and says to um, says to Cullen, uh, says to Spiro, his partner, "There's a, there's a guy in a bad shape up here with gunshot wounds. Uh, you know, you need to handcuff that guy." Okay, you then get two new two more cops turn up, uh, officers Fraunberger and Palmer, who then turn up on the scene. They run into the back office. Okay, they see John face down. They both give slightly varying different accounts whether Yoko was there. Framberger says he didn't see Yoko. Palmer says he did. Doesn't really matter. We can get to Yoko a bit later. They decide, apparently, according to Framberger, and maybe, uh, yes, Framberger said he took the pulse and he said he could feel a faint pulse. Now, I don't think this is true. I'm pretty certain this isn't true because, again, if you talk to all the medical people and, and take the statements of the medical officer and stuff like that, John would have been dead almost instantly from those wounds. So by the time the cops got there, we probably would have been two minutes after the event. John's dead. Uh, Jay Hastings, the concierge, said he was dead. He said he was stone dead. He heard a death gurgle. Whether that's true or not, we can't say because Jay said John did something we know he couldn't do. So we have to say take everything Jay said with a pinch of salt. But Jay said he was dead, and I agree with Jay. I think John was dead at that point. Apparently, Framberger said he felt a pulse, very faint pulse. They decided then to pick him up and carry him out, which is a real problem for the investigation because, of course, you don't know the body in situ. You can't figure out the journey of the body. They basically messed up a crime scene. So Palmer and Framberger, whether they did it deliberately or inadvertently, they really did a bad thing. But everyone says, including Framberger and Palmer, Palmer took the head and shoulders, okay? Framberger took the legs, and they carried John out through the offices, into the lobby, down the steps, through the vestibule, along the driveway, and shoved him into an Officer Moran's car, okay? Moran and Gamble, Officer Moran and Officer Gamble. And Moran is the officer who tried to get his 15 minutes of fame and say to the press afterwards, yeah, I asked John, do you know you are? And he nodded, which is just complete nonsense at that point. But you know, I thought he, he said, I'm John probably, Lennon. No, that, that's been added. I think originally he said, I, I said, do you know you are? And he sort of nodded, do you know? And he said, yeah. I, he might have said it. I don't know. It's, it's changed so often, Robbie, that lie. I think the original lie was i asked him if he knew he was and he nodded i think and i think it's moved on a bit since then i think it's embellishing been it's, it's everywhere it's everywhere it's uh, ultimately it didn't happen i'm pretty convinced about that if you talk to the medical people who saw his words and said that that guy died instantly so we can forget that but so 
That's what Palmer and Framberger did. Palmer and Framberger then took Yoko to the hospital, to the Roosevelt, to follow Moran's car. John's on the back seat of Moran's car, bleeding out. Uh, I think he's dead at that point, so it doesn't really matter. Um, Yoko gets taken with Palmer and Framberger to the Roosevelt. So that, that's the kind of immediate response history. Um, everybody who turned up later has told me that probably around about sort of two, three o'clock, it was over. There were no men in white suits. Uh, the cordon was taken away. Uh, there was a little kind of station set up sort of around about one o'clock, two o'clock, but about three o'clock in the back office, they kind of stopped interviewing everybody at the Dakota at that point, and the police kind of decamped. And allegedly, according to Joe Manny and Jay Hastings, so we've got two people verifying this, uh, Joe Grezik, who was one of the guys who came up with Joe Manny, got a mop, went into the front office back office who knows we'll get to that in a minute but mopped up john's blood okay so john's blood would you believe was mopped up just a few hours after he was shot there was no forensics there was no men in white suits there was none of that stuff i mean it's shocking really absolutely shocking what we do know interestingly though uh i just want to say it takes like two days usually at a hotel for a damn housekeeper to come by to even ask if i want my sheets changed and they managed to mop up that blood in a couple hours mopped it up pretty quick robbie mopped it up pretty quick but what's really interesting is we do know one thing about the forensics and the bullets they decided to hire someone to do that job that very specific job to find the spent bullets and the person they hired was commissioner ray kelly NYPD's top crime commissioner, who wasn't at the time a crime commissioner, of course, he was working at the NYPD and he was a captain at the emergency unit in New York at the time. And the reason we know this is Peter Cullen, when he got back to the station, one of the first officers were there, saw Ray Kelly, who used to work at the 20th precinct, but Cullen knew that Kelly was now an emergency officer. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Ray? And Ray said to Cullen, oh, I'm just here to collect some spent bullets. It's just a formality. Now, why the hell did the 20th Precinct, which was responsible for hundreds of thousands of people in their area. They had many, many cops, many, many detectives. Why did they need Ray Kelly to come in to find the bullets? It's almost like a, a Harvey Cartel guy, just phone him up and come in and, uh, and you know, help us clean this up, Ray. Why did they need Ray to help come and clean it up and find the bullets? Why couldn't they find the bullets themselves? So Ray has never discussed this. Interestingly, Ray has never revealed in his autobiography which I've sadly read uh, for research purposes, that he was there that night when um, John Lennon was shot. And he was there that night to do a very specific job. But Ray, Commissioner Ray Kelly, Colonel Ray Kelly from the Vietnam War, doesn't want to sort of remember that night and what he did. And I would like to find out from Ray Kelly, how many bullets did you find, Ray, spent bullets? And where were the spent bullets, Ray? Were they in the driveway? Were they in the vestibule? Were they in the stairway? Were they in the courtyard? Where'd you find them? Where'd you find the spent bullets? Were they in John? Because remember, John's supposed to have a couple of bullets that we found on the morgue receipt, one hollow, one on hollow. Three pass through him. We've got three low down bullet holes in the vestibule doors. You're not even talked about the bullet holes. It shouldn't be there. What, what, what's going on here? Where did you find them? What did the bullets do? Where did they travel? And what needs to be done Robbie, and I'm hoping that a TV documentary soon will do this, is that we need to have a digital reconstruction, a forensic architecture analysis of that driveway. And John, and Mark, and Padermo, and the vestibule doors, and the bullet holes. And we need to use modern technology to figure out what was most feasible. We need to go with what Mark Chapman thought happened, four in the back. We need to go with what the autopsy says, two in the back, two in the shoulder. And we need to go with what the, the doctors and nurses said for in the front. Take every scenario you want, but try and figure out what is the most feasible scenario with what we've got, i.e. where John was positioned, where Mark was positioned, and where those bullet holes are in the door. And, and look at the morgue receipts. Look at all the evidence that we had to have. I would like to think there were autopsy photos. Of course, none have been released. The autopsy has never been released on on, um, on orders of privacy reasons by the family. Fully understand that. An autopsy is a very you know private medical record. I do kind of have a pretty rough idea where the autopsy, I've spoken to people who have seen it, and apparently it says two in the kind of shoulder arm, one in the lower back, one in the upper back. Um, the nurses, when they sort of heard that there may be an autopsy record of a bullet wound in John's lower back, they just said absolutely impossible. You know, those nurses remember washed John's body, okay? They were there when he was being treated. They saw his wounds. They, they, just, they said there's no way we would have missed a bullet in John's lower left flank. Said no chance. 
just that's just not true. So gross is lying there, I think, if you go what the nurses are saying. But anyway, I digress. What about uh Richard Peterson, uh the cab driver? <laughs> ah, good old Richard Peterson. Yeah, he's an important guy. Uh he is an important witness. Um the official narrative that Richard Peterson gave on the night of the murder was I pulled and he, I've got his statement, his original statement, which is very important because it's changed and it's evolved over the years. Richard has evolved his testimony as so many people have. He's added stuff. But the original testimony that he gave on Hoffman was I pulled up behind the Levin's limousine. I had two passengers in the back. As they were about to pay me, I looked up. I saw Mark Chapman standing there, lift up a gun and start firing. Um, I then assumed he was shooting at Lennon because he saw Yoko and Lennon get out before this. And because Peterson was familiar with the Dakota driveway, he assumed, excuse me, that Lennon was by the vestibule by the time Chapman started to get his gun out and fire. OK, so that's a, that's a really important statement because it kind of and I think it might be true. I think Chapman might be firing blanks. So that kind of fits a scenario that I think is possible. But here's, here's where it starts to get troubling. Peterson says he doesn't know what the doorman was doing. He didn't see a doorman at all. There had to be a doorman there. Uh, was Padermo, did he go off for a, a, a cigarette? Did he go off? I don't know. What, what was Padermo doing? Did he go into his gold booth? Apparently he didn't do that. So why didn't Peterson see Padermo? That's important. The second thing that's a problem for Peterson is two witnesses, one of the Dakota and one across the road in the building across the border, both said that immediately after gunfire, they looked at the scene and they saw a yellow taxi speed off at top speed. Okay, so that's a problem. Because what Peterson said he did next was after seeing all this go on, he says he bravely got out of his cab, left the cab there, okay? Now, no one has ever said cops or witnesses that they saw a yellow cab sitting there all night, but apparently Peterson left it there, okay, <laughs> next to the scene. He says he then ran off for help, banging on doors, saying there's been a shooting, come and help. Then he ran back to the scene and picked up from people what was going on, and he got to the station, gave a statement. Now, here's the problem. No one remembers seeing a yellow cab there. People remember seeing a yellow cab speed off really quickly after gunfire. And Peterson, unfortunately, has decided to add to his story because that night he never said that Mark Chapman called out to John Lennon in his statement because I've got his statement. I've got his original statement. What he's now saying in an Apple documentary is, I heard Mark Chapman in my cab in a busy New York street. We're not busy, but there would have been ambient noise. It would have been winter, possibly the windows were up, but he somehow heard Mark Chapman call out to John Lennon. Now that's something Mark's never said happened. It's something Yoko never said happened. But now I think Peterson has seen many documentaries. He's read many books and articles and he's, he's seen this Chapman called out myth and he's adding it, okay? Now, if you watch that Apple documentary that came out last year, Murder Without a Trial, the way they've done the edit, and I'm sure this wasn't done on purpose, it's just the way the edit came out, it kind of makes you think that Peterson saw Chapman's bullets hit John. He didn't. He saw allegedly Chapman pick a gun up and start firing that gun, but he never saw Chapman's bullets hit John. And he told me this many times. He told Hoffman on the night of the murder or a couple of days after the murder, he gave a statement that he didn't see John's bullets, uh, Chapman's bullets hit John. But that Apple video kind of makes you think the way it's been cut together that Peterson saw it all and saw Chapman shoot John. He didn't. He saw Chapman raise a gun. He saw Chapman fire. John was way out of his eyesight at that point. And of course he would have been because the way, you know, the, the yellow taxi's there, John's gone into the driveway. He just couldn't see around a corner to see where John was. That, that makes sense. Peterson has said other stuff to me that just doesn't make sense, which makes me think he's perhaps a guy who likes to embellish. He said on the night of the murder when he was being questioned at the NYPD, he said they got John's bloody clothes out and put them in front of him. They got the gun out, allegedly, and put the gun in front of him. It just the, the, the clothes weren't there that night. I know they weren't there that night because I know they were picked up at the medical officer's um, autopsy building the next morning by Tony Palmer. He picked them up in a paper bag. And I think there's even some photography of Tony coming out of the chief medical officer's office with a bag of John's clothes to get into a car to race off back to the 20th precinct to put it into evidence. So... John's bloody clothes were not put in front of Peterson that night in, uh, in the 20th precinct. But Peterson wants to add. And even when I was interviewing him, Robbie, with Peterson, you know, he kind of added stuff. I kind of said to him, did John and Mark, did you see them interact? Did John walk past Mark? And he said, um, he told me, oh, actually, now you come to mention it. Yeah. Yeah. I think he, they nodded at each other. And I was like, you just added that. You, you've just, you're just adding stuff now. 
You know, you're adding stuff that you want me to, you know, think. And so Peterson's important. He was there. I'm almost certain he was there. I'm almost certain he saw stuff. But I think when there was gunfire, I think he got in. I think he raced off away from the scene as anyone would in a car. When you hear gunfire, you get the hell out of there. I think he parked the car up somewhere else down the street. I think he came back on the scene. I think he spoke to Badermo. I think he spoke to secondary witnesses like Sean Strube, who picked up stuff from Badermo and various other people, possibly cops. And I think he picked up roughly what happened. John got shot as he's walking in. This guy did it and he shot him from here. And I think he thought, here's my 15 minutes. I'm going to say I saw everything, or at least I'm going to say I saw this guy pick up a gun and start shooting. And um, and Peterson kind of dis he disappeared. Like most people, he disappeared from history up until a couple of years ago, until I found him, until the Apple series put him on telly. So now he's kind of like the main guy. He's the new Paderma. He's the witness who allegedly apparently saw it all, but he didn't. He didn't see it all. And to be fair to Peterson, he's never said he saw it all. He only saw partly what was going on, allegedly. So, yeah, all I say to people is don't be fooled by what you see on TV. Sometimes an edit can be put together in a way that makes it look more dramatic and more revealing than it actually is. And what Peterson saw is revealing because he places Chapman by the sidewalk, remember, which is important because Chapman wasn't down by the vestibule which is where I think the person was who shot John was. I think the person was inside that vestibule. Some people could say, well, Chapman must have walked and done that. But we know he didn't do that, Robbie, because not only have we got Peterson's testimony, we've got a guy called Guy Luthan, who was across the road in the building across the road. And he said the second he heard gunfire, he looked out of his building and he saw Chapman and Paderma standing by the sidewalk. Nina Rosen, don't forget Nina, she comes back on the scene. She, saw, she sees Chapman and the doorman by the sidewalk. So we know Chapman wasn't standing in the vestibule which is where I believe the second shooter was, and which is why I believe Lennon was assassinated. Well, how do you try and convince people when you have things like you mentioned, the uh, bullets in the vestibule door? You know, when they hear something like that, or if they're shown a photograph that might have bullets or something like that in there, I mean, how do you explain the bullets in the vestibule door then? You know, here's the thing about those bullets in the vestibule door. Um, think about it, right? Here's, here's what we know about them. There was two in the door facing the street that Chapman could see. There was another door behind it that Chapman couldn't see that had another bullet hole in it, which could have been one of the ones passing through and went into the far door. I know from NYPD cops that I spoke to that that bullet hole troubled them. They couldn't quite figure out how that would have happened with regards to what they knew Chapman was doing. Um, it, it's, it's whichever scenario you, you, you sort of take it, it, it doesn't make sense because hollow point bullets are not supposed to pass through, John. Okay, so. For those bullet holes to work that low down, what John would have had to have done is he'd have had to turn around if you go with he was shot in the front. And we must do, because that's what all the medical evidence now tells us. He probably had to kneel down or crouch down for the bullets to actually pass through. So he, he kind of crouched down or kneeled down or fell down, take your pick. Two of the bullets that went into his upper left chest, even though they're not supposed to pass through, did pass through, and we know three did. One went off somewhere, we don't know where that went. But two went into that vestibule door we could see. One is slightly higher than the other, so John must have been moving as well, which is very improbable. And one of the ones that went into the vestibule door carried on into the other door. And the one that went through John went into that vestibule door that we could see, the two bullets, um, disappeared somewhere. Who knows where? And Ray Kelly no doubt found it. But here's what's interesting. You would think, wouldn't you, Robbie, if that happened, if those bullet holes were caused by bullets that were passing through John, you would have just a smidgen when you think of blood, just maybe just a little tiny bit. spot. I mean, it may be, I mean, I'm, you know, he had a leather jacket, maybe not, but the cops, Joe Manny, Jay Hastings, they've all told me the same thing. There was no blood on those doors. There was just no blood. Those doors had no blood on them at all, inside or outside. There were just bullet holes, no blood. So the only way I could see those bullet holes being placed there is someone shooting them from the street. Possibly some of Chapman's bullets missed. But remember, if Chapman's bullets are missing, we've got a problem because he only had a five, five shot revolver. Okay. Five. We know four, five, four hit John. Okay. So if two missed, it's one too many. <laughs> okay. We know one missed. But well, now you're repeating the whole Sirhan thing where we got uh, too many bullets for a gun. We've got a problem. Got a problem with those two. So no one ever talks about these bullet holes, Robbie, because they're too problematic for the official narrative. They, 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 they're never mentioned in, in uh, shockingly, disgustingly, in all the documentaries that have been made about John Lennon's murder. Boy, there's been loads. 
never mentioned. Never mentions one. We only even know about those pictures. We've only got some shots of those pictures because an ITV director who I know called Kevin Sim did a brilliant um, John Lennon documentary, probably the best one actually, Chapman Lennon one, called The Man Who Shot John Lennon in 1988. And he told me that he got an, an NYPD insider at the time to give him some crime scene photos. And he uses them in this documentary. And you can see it in a very fast montage, bang, 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 bang. He, 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 sadly, the original um, images that he got from the NYPD inside have been lost because shockingly ITV back in the day, and I know because I used to work there, they never kept materials from shows. So he would have got he would have got the, the, the still images, black and white images, and he used them in the program. And probably a few years later, it would have got binned, which is just, I know, outrageous and shocking, but that's just the way they used to work in those days. And I used to work in archives as well, so I know exactly how they used to operate back then. Nothing was kept. It was all thrown away. But he told me that he got it from an NYPD insider. There's, a, there's also a shot of the back office with some blood on the floor, which is interesting. And he told me that the NYPD insider got spooked. He said after he gave him some images, you know, uh, under the counter kind of thing, you know, clandestine sent to the production office. He wouldn't give he, he, something scared him. He said and he, he he wouldn't give us any more stuff. He said there was loads more stuff, loads more photography he could have given us, but he wouldn't give it to us. And so we've got two official photos: one Associated Press to those two bullet holes. The guy, no doubt, the Associated Press guy who got there early on the scene took this very famous picture of a couple of cops walking around with a torch and and the long picture of the two bullet holes. We've got one that the DA's office, to be fair. Uh, released a few years ago from behind those vestibule doors and again you see the two bullet holes but you don't clearly see the one that passed through in the other door and um and that's it that's it that's that's the and, we, and i think the apple tv series got another crime scene photo that was very similar to the associated press one from the sidewalk from the street so they've kept all the crime scene photos under wraps right and, and i find that deeply suspicious because these guys have never been that they've never been that shy about revealing gory crime scene photos, have they? They always seem to get released, or, or gory autopsy photos. I'd like to see some gory autopsy. I mean, anyone who's familiar with the Manson murders, no problem releasing those disgusting images. Anyone who's seen JFK's two autopsies, no problem. Yeah, here's some autopsy photos. Half of them look doctored, of course. But they got no problem with letting them get out to the public. But for some reason, photography on the John Lennon murder with regards to at the scene, and I'm, I'm not after technicolor blood here just 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 show me where the bullets were you know give me some close-ups of those bullet holes in the doors you know let's let's just see some stuff you know give us the front concierge's office because what's interesting is that whole concierge area the lobby the concierge front office back office i've only managed to piece that together from what joe manny the cops and jay hastings have told me and we've kind of managed to work out what it is now because the photography in that vestibule in that stairway in the lobby in the offices from the time it's impossible. It's a, there was a complete lockdown. You cannot find an image from 1980 of those areas. So that's been a real, I think that's been conscientious. I think they've, they've, they've kind of, someone has made a decision that no one is going to get to see the scene of where John Lennon was killed from a visual photography point of view. And I think that's, that's deeply disturbing for sure. Has any of the television or docu-series that you've seen on the Lennon murder gotten anything right or gotten close to maybe a, a sliver of something different than the official narrative besides that's actually incriminating, I would say? It's a good question. A really good question. I think I think Kevin tried to focus on Captain Rye and he spoke, he, he used a lot of, um, he kind of, he was, he was given false pretenses on it. He was told by Chapman and the people who were handling Chapman at the time that Chapman would give him an interview. And he came over in 87, 88, it would have been from, from England to New York and Chapman got cold feet or the people that were handling Chapman at the time got cold feet. So he had to contact our good old friend Jim Gaines again with his ever helpful tapes from the psychiatrists and the hypnotists that, that Jonathan Marks put into Chapman's cell. So he used those tapes that Jim, Jim bless him, just loves to give out um, selectively. And it's always about like, you know, I, I was catching the rye. I thought I was catching the rye. He walked past me and I shot him. And no detail. It doesn't say where he shot him and what, after, what John did afterwards. Always, you know, broad strokes stuff. And um, and Kevin had to use that. But that's a good documentary because Kevin got to talk to some of Chapman's girlfriends. He got to talk to some of Chapman's girlfriends' um, parents. And they sort of talk about how Mark Chapman's personality changed. So I think that's really important. I think there's some important first-hand stuff in there. He didn't really get to anyone of interest. He didn't get to Gloria. Gloria never talks to anybody apart from a glossy 
you know, magazine type kind of thing that's going to ask her about her makeup and hair. She doesn't go in, Gloria doesn't go into details. And when she does, she goes on a Christian podcast and, and spreads a lot of misinformation. So I better start reading my Bible. Yeah, yeah, we could we could go on about Gloria. We could do a Gloria show all by ourselves, bless her. But yeah, Glo- Gloria doesn't do much um, of, of interest, of substance. He, he didn't get Dana Reeves, Mark's nefarious friend, who allegedly gave him the hollow point bullets. Dana Reeves was a New York, wasn't New York, it was a Lancer cop, who was a kind of Rambo type aggressive guy who befriended Mark when he was probably around about sort of 16, 17. Reeves was older, rougher, tougher. He, you know, why he befriended the meek, mild Christian Mark Chapman is, is a mystery. But we we know Reeves gave him, allegedly, Mark thought, the hollow point bullets that he thought allegedly killed John Lennon. And Reeves is now in prison for child molestation offences. So Reeves uh, Reeves is a guy that you could, let's, let's say kindly, could be compromised. Let's put it that way. A man of great interest. Boy, would I love an hour talking to Dana Reeves about his relationship with Mark Chapman and who is connected to Dana. But anyway, Dana's, again, a topic for another another show. But, um, yeah, getting back to your really good question about documentaries that have done anything decent and of worth, uh, I'd say no. Uh, I'd say they're all pretty much the same crew, same... Kim Hogreth, the prosecuting DA, assistant prosecuting DA, comes out, gives his usual stick, virtue signaling about, I'm not going to say the man's name. I'm not going to give him what he wanted, fame. Yeah, 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 Kim. Talks about his hollow point bullets. Talks about the, the hit list. All BS now. All been discredited. I don't think Kim Hogger is going to dare come on a TV screen again. Because if he does, I hope someone's going to say, what about those drugs, Kim, in Mark's hotel room? What were those drugs? Why did you conceal those drugs? Where's Jose Bodomo's statement, Kim? Can we see that? Can we see all his statements? Where's the crime scene photos, Kim? Can we see those? So Kim knows now that people aren't going to go along with it in this trance. Like, oh, Mark Chapman did it. Oh, my God, isn't it awful? He's the most evil man who ever lived. People people are now wising up to that murder. So Kim, Kim, I think, won't come again. And you get cops coming on, Cullen, Spiro, talking about, you know, they got there on the scene and blah, blah, blah. So it's just the usual official narrative BS. But what you don't get in any of them, and I, I ask people to go and watch them on YouTube. You can find them on YouTube. They never say what really happened to John. They never say where the bullets hit him. They never say what John did after the bullets hit him. They never talk about Mark Chapman's nefarious background with hypnotists and psychiatrists and exorcists and all the rest of it. All that stuff's completely glossed over. Not even glossed over, it's just ignored. They just focus on, I've said this before, they spoke, they spoke, focus on the where and when. So they'll tell you December the 8th, Dakota, Mark Chapman was there. It was 11, it was 10.50, it was cold night. But they'd never tell you how. How did it go down? How did it exactly go down? And why did it go down, Robbie? Why did this guy who knew nothing about the Beatles, didn't care about the Beatles. Remember, he went to lunch the day of the murder with Jerry and Jude, like two Lennon obsessive fans who are always there. Chapman took them to lunch, okay, just across the road. And I've got their statement, I've got their testimony, both of them, who both say to Ron Hoffman, he knew nothing about the Beatles. He had no idea about the Beatles. He wasn't even aware that a month earlier, John had released Double Fantasy, his solo album. He wasn't even aware that album was out. He just about knew that Just Like Starting Over was a single. Is this a Lennon obsessive? Is this a Beatles obsessive? No, it's not. But they have to have us believe that, Robbie, for this story to make sense. So when you get the truth of of the John Lennon assassination, the truth of who Mark Chapman was, and the truth of what really went down that night, the official narrative does not add up at all. It's a nonsense. And I think, to be fair to the Apple documentary, they got people like Jay Hastings and Joe Manny on camera. Very important. It's good to see them. I think they gave more testimony in, than, than probably was shown because I've spoken to Joe and Jay about that show and they said, yeah, we, we gave very long interviews. So I hope more will come. Uh, they also mentioned Milton Klein. Uh, they show some footage of Milton Klein in that Apple TV series, Murder Without a Trial. They show some very good footage of Milton Klein, some I haven't seen before, of Milton talking about how he can program someone to kill and how he's a Manchurian candidate guy who's, you know, who worked for the CIA. So I think it's very important that a mainstream TV documentary series like that Apple series is mentioning MK Ultra and is mentioning uh, Milton Klein and brainwashing, uh, even though they don't go very deep. They gloss over it quite quickly, but it's quite important that they did it. And I think that's a, that's a good first step. The people that I'm talking to now to do a proper documentary, I'm hoping, I'm hopeful now my book's come out and it's been you know universally acclaimed and it's selling well and doing getting good reviews. 
I'm hoping now that people in the TV and film industry will go, do you know what? And I, I think it's going to happen. The people I'm talking to are certainly telling me it's going to happen. We're going to get a documentary or documentaries that are finally going to tell people the truth of what happened that night. And I think when people, when your mainstream Beatles fan, true crime fan, Normie gets to see and hear what really happened that night and who Mark Chapman was and who was surrounding him. I think they'll be, I think they'll be shocked, Robbie. I think their minds will be blown. I really do. And, um, and I'm sure many people won't be able to get their head around it. And I'm sure, you know, they'll just say, oh, it's conspiracy theory, blah, blah, blah. I don't like it. It's conspiracy theory. I don't want to hear about it. You know, and it, there's so many of those people even now who hear about what I'm doing uh, to their shame. They're supposed to be John Lennon Beatles fans, obsessives. And they just they come out with a pithy line. I don't I don't talk about conspiracy theories as if it was a plural that can just be put in one box. So I, I, I you know, I really I have great disdain for these people. Um, I get it. If you want to read my book, listen to my work and then go, it's a conspiracy theory. There's nothing behind it. OK, I get it. Uh, you know, you, at least you've read it and you've looked into it. But to not look into it and just to dismiss it with that ridiculous phrase that's so overused is is shameful. I think for anybody who calls himself a John Lennon or a Beatles fan, because the, you know I, I've got first-hand evidence, Robbie. I've spoken to everybody multiple times. You know, there's documents in this book. This this is not a book. This is not some pie in the sky kind of theory that I've just plucked out of thin air. And I, and it's important to note here that when I went into it, Robbie, I had no idea what I was going to find. I had no idea there was a conspiracy. I, the, the thought of a second shooter or a Manchurian candidate or a Milton Klein CIA guy involved, all this stuff. I had no idea. But when I started to find it out, it was like, well, I just have to kind of keep going and put this stuff out there. And, and I, you know, as I say in the book, I don't tell people what to think. I put all the information out there, Robbie. I'll give you all the testimony. I'll give you all the forensics. I'll give you all the documentation I've got. I'll give you all the previous history. And I try to analyze what's been said and why. And then I say at the end of the book, you make your own mind up. Here's what I think probably happened. But you know what? You make your mind up. You decide what you think. That. So I kind of asked the reader to be the, the investigator. And I'd say the one phrase, if I had to say one phrase that has constantly come up from everybody that's read the book, Robbie, is mind blown. My mind's been blown. I cannot believe we never knew all this stuff. I can't believe all this stuff was was concealed from us. And, um, and I suppose you've got to kind of blame the media for that. You know, the MIPD swept under the carpet, no doubt from high don't look too far here guys we don't want to be you know getting into any murky conspiracy stuff we've got our guy getting banged up as quick as possible you've got the da's office you know the way your your sister works in america you know a prosecuting da is not going to be looking for anomalies <laughs> that's just not what kim Hogreff was going to be doing he's, he's he doesn't care about anomalies he, it's part of his job to overlook anomalies he just wants to nail the guy get his prosecution and shamefully and i'm not quite sure how you're your system works really in this regard back in the day. I know how it works now, but Hogreff, Kim Hogreff, the assistant prosecuting DA and the lead detective on Hoffman often worked together, often went on trips together. Now, if that's not a conflict of interest, I don't know what it is. Because where is Mark Chapman's chance for a defense when the prosecuting DA is working hand in hand with the lead detective? How does Mark Chapman get any chance for anybody to look into this case properly with that little cozy you know, bromance going I on. I smell scepterfuge. There you go. I know you mentioned what we talked about and we kind of clarified that it's not the same Jose Padermo, but is there any chance that it's the same Spiro Ag or Spiro? Well, you know, Spiro Agnew for Richard Nick. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's a bad joke. <laughs> <laughs> no, you've done I, excellent I, work on all this stuff, seriously. I mean, I you I could pick your brain for hours about so many subjects. You had mentioned one I want to get to just on as a final question because you've given me so much of your time and I really do appreciate all the times you've given me to educate me and also my audience on the massive amount of work you've done to really uncover you're welcome thank things. you robbie but thank sean you. sean straub i i have to know just a little bit about him i mean if anything you can give really because that's a uh, you mentioned him and he was written down on my list of people i wanted to talk to you about okay a uh, good looking guy sean young sort of photogenic guy uh turns up uh outside of dakota um and is interviewed by the press you know, the media at the time, there's lots of interviews of Sean outside the Roosevelt saying that he saw John being carried out. He saw his glasses covered in blood. 
and he looked in a bad way, uh, which is interesting and important because obviously, you know, he did, you know, according to Sean, he heard gunfire. He was a few blocks away. By the time he got there, he said there were cops there. So he probably got there 90 seconds to two minutes after John was shot. Um, people were beginning to gather at that point. He said uh, cops were there keeping people at bay, so he wasn't walking into the driveway getting you know real first hand stuff. But he said he did see John getting carried out by two cops or cops, as he said, and, and that's definitely what happened. But here's where the Sean Strubin um, story gets interesting. He then um, he then turns up being interviewed outside the Roosevelt Hospital same night. So whether he was driven there by the media, whether he made it there, it wasn't that far. I think you could walk sort of 10, 15 minutes, you could be at the Dakota, the Roosevelt from the Dakota. So you probably could have walked there that night and no doubt did. But possibly took a cab, possibly taken there by a media van. Who knows? But he gives a very interesting and revealing interview at the hospital. He says, um, you know, John was shot as he was going inside the vestibule, which is something that Ron Hoffman says outside the hospital. So Sean kind of, Sean kind of is a useful guy, but he's a second-hand guy. And there's quite a few Sean's. And he, he no doubt picked up stuff you know, from other people like Jose or cops or other witnesses who heard stuff from Jose or the cops. So, or possibly even Joe Manny and Jay Hastings. I doubt if they spoke to people, to be fair, they, they, they both told me they didn't. So I suspect it was mainly Jose chatting cops on the scene who heard stuff from colleagues like Cullen and Spiro, and then they spread it, and it you know, it spread to some of the bystanders. But what's interesting is after his Dakota and Roosevelt interviews that night, Strube, he then turns up in the studio the next day. And he's there in the same clothes and his denim jacket. And again, looking, you know, very, very photogenic, attractive guy chatting about the murder, but almost as if he saw it. He's starting to talk now in a way that he witnessed the whole thing, which, of course, he didn't. He turned up as they were carrying John's body out. So I think with Sean, there's been a lot of sort of conspiracy about Sean that he kind of like he was a plant and he was put in there to, you know, bolster the official narrative. I don't think that's true. I, I think Sean is a little bit like Richard Peterson, and I think he's a little bit like some other some other people, like Dr. Lynn, where they see their chance for 15 minutes. The media were desperate to kind of find some kind of narrative as quickly as possible on the night. It was all very confusing. You know, one of the guys who talks to Ron Hoffman in the hospital, and you can see this on my YouTube channel, he mentions one of the journalists about the possibility of a second shooter, so which I find really interesting. So they were trying to piece it together very quickly at the time. And someone like Sean Struber says, yeah, I was there. I kind of saw stuff. I heard stuff. I heard gunfire. Saw him being carried out. They kind of thought, well, we'll use this guy as our main witness. And most people to this day think Sean Strub saw it all. Or they think there were other Sean Strubes who were walking past who saw it all. Or they think, or oh, Yoko saw it all and could tell us. Or the doorman. But what's interesting is, Robbie, and this is very telling, I think, it's a good way to finish this. Yoko, Strube, Padermo, even Chapman, none of these people can give us a definitive, this is exactly what happened when John and Yoko got out of that cab, got out of that limo and walked into the driveway and John got shot. This is exactly what happened just before. This is what happened, exactly what happened when John was getting shot. And this is exactly what happened after John got shot. All of it is unknown. And we can only piece it together from different testimony and different forensics and different probabilities of what's possible in that distance, in that light, with regards to what the medical people saw, with regards to what the autopsy said. You can only piece it together piecemeal. And that is absolutely unbelievable, isn't it? You would think that in such a small contained area, an event happening to one of the world's most famous men who ever lived, we would know exactly what happened to John, but we're still not completely sure. I think I've got a pretty good idea now. I think my book lays it out. I think I've got the best guess with all the, you know, the missing pieces that we still have. I think I've got a pretty good idea what happened. I think I've got a pretty good idea what's behind it, but I can't be certain. And I, I've said this before to you, Robbie, on some of my other talks with you, I really hope this is just the start of a process. And I hope that pressure, people start to become more aware of this case and more awake to what actually happened and what is what is missing. And I hope pressure is put on the DA's office and the NYPD to release crime scene photos, to release Padermo's statement, to tell us why they conceal things like uh, unidentified drugs in Chapman's room and remember a metal object that was found in John's ashes. All this stuff that's now come out, reveal all of it, You know, be open about the whole thing. And then we can put it all to bed. 
there'll be no people saying well, what happened, what didn't happen. There'll be no crazy Padermo was Bay of Pigs and all the rest of it. All that stuff can be just put away and we can get to the truth, which is, let's face it, what John Lennon was obsessed with. All I want is the truth is one of his great songs said. So that's all we want now. We just want the truth. But I don't think we'll ever get it. Just to finish, I don't think we'll ever get the truth because I think the truth is too uncomfortable. And I think the truth will reveal that Mark Chapman was a Manchurian patsy and John Lennon was shot by a second shooter, which is anyone who studies their crime history of the 20th century will know is a scenario that could fit quite easily to other very famous assassinations. What we call a day tripper. Had to throw in a Beatles reference. Um, like it. Like it. Uh, David, I appreciate the time again. Uh, I will have to get give you an email address for a fan that does want a signed copy. He's going to send his book over and pay for the postage himself. So obviously your oh, book yeah, is that's, definitely that's very kind. Yeah, no having, problem. Having a huge impact. But uh, where can people find your book for the listeners out there? I'm going to make sure I link it in the description. Okay, they can find it on uh, on all Amazon outlets. It's it's called Mind Games: The Assassination of John Lennon. It will be coming out soon on Kindle, probably in about a month's time. It will be in other major bookshops across the world on shelves. We're we're doing separate deals with separate publishers in separate territories. Uh, shamefully, all the big US and UK publishers at the time when I took this to them a couple of years ago uh, just balked at it uh, to their shame. Um, but that's changed now, and now people are coming to me wanting to represent me on the book. So that's good. So I think it's going to go beyond Amazon. But for now, you can buy it on Amazon. Um, you can also find my videos that I spoke about in this conversation on assassination of Lennon on my YouTube channel. There's lots of videos on there, lots of explanations about the videos. So please go on there and share them. You can find the same one on Instagram, same thing, assassination of Lennon, same on my TikTok, assassination of Lennon. Find me on Twitter, Lennon Murder. Um, so come there and and uh, and you know ask me any questions. I do keep it open. I do get a lot of questions. So if you do ask me a question on there, please please bear with me. I will get to you eventually. Um, and yeah, just all I can say to you to to your listeners and your viewers is, Robbie, spread the word that all is not well in John Lennon's assassination. Spread the information and and keep looking, keep digging, guys. Be respectful, obviously, to everybody. Uh, you know, research is something that I think should be done carefully. Uh, and don't don't step on too many toes but but you know keep looking guys keep digging because i'm still finding stuff today I, I found out something today actually Robert, i'll give it exclusive i found out today that mark chapman went to iran on his world tour he famously went on a world tour uh paid for by the castle memorial psychiatric hospital we know he went to places like india and he went to europe and places like that but apparently he went to iran uh or he's in, and it was in the summer of 78 was it 79 I can't remember now, but he, basically I've got I've got evidence now that he was traveling to Iran. Uh, now, why Mark Chapman went to Iran just before the revolution, when it would have been a real hotbed of um, of activity, um, is, is is a bit of a mystery, isn't it, really, Robbie? It's kind of like, well, well, you know, I, I get a world tour when you want to see the sites like the Taj Mahal and, and all the rest of it, but why, why is Mark Chapman going to Iran? So that's a new one. Um, not quite sure what he got up to there. No one's ever mentioned it ever before, but I've, I've managed to find a, a postcard, would you believe, that he sent to his beloved Gloria, where he's mentioning his uh, his upcoming trip to Iran. So that's quite interesting. So what I'm trying to point out is, Robbie, is that more stuff is coming out all the time. And I think more stuff will come out. I hope Mark Chapman will eventually read my book. If he does, I think it will blow his mind, like it's blown everyone else's mind. Uh, I am concerned for Mark. If he ever does get out, I think he's probably safe for staying in. I can't say for certain he's not part of some kind of plot. I think there's a lot of evidence pointing towards that. So I'm not for one minute saying Mark Chapman is 100% innocent. I do think that all the forensics point to the fact that he didn't shoot John Lennon. So, yeah, please come and follow me, guys. Please spread the word. Uh, this is this. There's more to come. There's more to come. I'm going to link all your links in the description, David. It's been a pleasure chatting with you again, my friend. And thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank. Stay tuned for next episode.